It is always great when the uh, guys from inside the camp step up. People like uh, Alan here and here volunteering to do the uh, the recording. But tonight we got some folks that uh, do a living history. These uh, guys show how it really was, and I'm proud to say they're members of this camp here. So please welcome Bear Butler and company. Company. Thank you. is actually Douglas. Uh, so if you want to say Douglas Butler, um, now though I am Sergeant Butler in the 8th Confederate Cav and 7th Kentucky U.S. Cavalry. We don't claim that one. Uh, yeah. uh, I have brought our company uh, captain, uh, Captain uh, Andy Bodenheimer. Come on up. He's also uh, been in the uh, reenacting hobby with me for over 20 years. Well, we were talking about it last night. Between us, we've probably got 50 years of doing this. So, uh, kind of sort of what we're going to do, we're going to talk about us as reenactors and reenacting in general. Everything from trying to start an event, putting on events, stupid questions from kids, whole nine yards. All right. I'm going to. I saved everybody from puking. <clears throat> I did not put on my Yankee, full Yankee uniform <laughs> until now. <laughs> As he said, we're the 8th Confederate Cavalry. Um, we also have a Yankee impression. I forget what the designation is because I don't like Yankees. Southern Kentucky. <laughs> You're here. kidding. Anyway. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. that's good enough to shoot. <laughs> Uh, we portray unmounted cavalry, uh, the 8th Confederate. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. Doug and I pretty much grew up together in Tallahassee. Uh, he started out reenacting in the uh, SCA, doing the medieval, let's bash the crap out of each other. Dress up in armor and beat the snot out of each other. <laughs> And I drug, I drug him to an event one time, and he said, oh, this is so much fun. Less painful. Less painful. Uh, well, I don't know about that. In general. Uh, a little bit about me first, and I'll let him talk. When I first started, I was about yay tall. And I was a powder monkey for simple battery. Gun owned by Dick Brubaker. I'm sure y'all know that name. Uh, Simples is folded by now. But at that time, I was also in Selden's Battery out of Tuscaloosa. I was in the Alabama State Militia Artillery, which actually did confer me membership into the Alabama State Militia. Uh, and I was in Cross Battery. I said, you know, I like shooting the big guns. My very first event, we fired a round off a squirrel fed dead from a tree right beside us. <laughs> Let me interject. My first school days at Tallahassee, number one, I was part of a 12-pound uh, Napoleon crew. First round, we shot off. Little kid over here pissed in his pants. I was hooked after that point. <laughs> that was also the same school day we found a bird in the field and we shoved him down the barrel of the cannon and watched feathers go. <laughs> uh, Y'all are getting some chuckles. Uh, that's, that's what we like to do. We like to have fun. But I, I said, I want to do something different. I want to learn more. So I joined the 6th Alabama Cavalry. How long has the Pratt and Dragoons camp been around? Yeah. Right after the Pratt and Dragoons camp was founded, a lot of us actually formed the 3rd Alabama Cavalry Pratt and Dragoons. We had our meeting right over here at the courthouse, <coughs> overlooking the mill, and that was where we formed the 3rd Alabama Cavalry. At one time, I was in the 6th Alabama Cavalry, the 3rd Alabama Cavalry, and the 53rd Alabama Partisan Rangers. I've been, I've reenacted with Florida batteries. I've reenacted with South Carolina 
matters. I've been everywhere from Gettysburg to Texas. Why is this important? If we don't show people what happened back then, all they're going to have is words on page. I can read every book in the world, but there's an adage that I learned that I learned a long time ago. If you tell me, I forget. If you show me, I remember. But if you involve me, I understand. Ain't nobody in here too old to be around. Ain't nobody in here too old to continue to learn. I have learned more in one hour sitting around a campfire than I have ever learned reading books. And that ain't including the whiskey that went with it. Hi. <laughs> Okay, we are reenactors. Somebody has to play the bad guy. Which is usually us. I, I, I love honestly, playing it so well. And honestly, this last year, uh, we're averaging 15 on the field at once, on average. Anywhere from 15 to 20. So we're, for example, Tallahassee. I think we were split half and half, or were we all Yankee? We were all Yankee. Okay, Briarfield, we were half and half because uh, Dr. Aishas and I were snipers with the. Uh, yeah, y'all left, left my gorilla, right? Uh, somebody has to do it. Our unit is a little bit different because I have studied the time period. I have studied Quantrill and Mosby. I have studied the regular cavalry units. I have studied Forrest. I've studied Hampton, Hilliard. I've studied Joe Wheeler. And but you haven't studied yourself on Sunday? We snuck up on you. <laughs> you, almost, you almost walked on top of Ron. But uh, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'll sworn to secrecy. Y'all know that the archives has Joe Wheeler's uniform. Yes. They got it from, from the moth before they were able to sell it off for profit. I saw it the day that it came in. I got friends in the archives and to be that close to it. The 8th Confederate Cavalry was part of Wheeler's Corps. The 8th Confederate Cavalry, we researched, we found a unit that nobody had ever traced. This unit rode more miles, fought in more battles in more states than any other unit in the Confederate Army. From Mississippi to Virginia to Kentucky to Georgia. By the time, by 1864, they were so emaciated you notice the skeleton right there? Joe Wheeler called the 8th Confederate. I've been in battle. I'm not supposed to look presentable. We're reenacting. Okay. The 8th Confederate Cavalry was called his skeleton calf. And to this day, we still use the monster of the skeleton calf. But this is important. We've got to get new people in. In our heyday in the 90s, when this unit was formed, when this organization right here at this camp was formed, we had thousands of reenactors. We only have hundreds now. We need y'all in this. If not you, your cousins, your nephews, your, your, your sons, your great grandchildren. You will learn more in one hour doing this than you ever will play a video game. Hallelujah, holy shit. Now, a lot of you older guys, you can go join an artillery unit. I would love to see the Pratt and Dragoons go out and fundraise and buy a full-scale gun and form your own battery. And actually, most reenactments do pay a bounty to help cover costs yeah, of powder. Yeah, they do help cover costs of powder because it's expensive. But y'all can form your own battery. You can come out here and do your, have your own cannon salute. You can sit here and put on a living history over here in Millbrook and point it right at City Hall and they can't say nothing back. <laughs> Part of being a living historian is you got protections under the federal government. Hey, did, what, did, hey, we, did we shoot a few salutes one time on the Capitol grounds? Yes, we did. How many, how many people have actually got to shoot a gun on the Capitol steps? <laughs> Raise your hand. You talking about modern or antiques? Well, still shoot, shoot. Okay. 
How many of y'all almost got arrested on the Capitol steps? <laughs> How many of y'all remember Wyatt Willis? Y'all remember when he got arrested? Yeah. I went up there the very next day with the same flagpole, same flag, Bush guy on videotaping, and I said, I'm right here. They wouldn't touch me. He had a discrimination case. I think he got, what, $2? $2 out right of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Let's anyway, um, you got artillery. Artillery, uniform. Go get your tent. If you don't like camping outside, roughing it, go get you an RV. <clears throat> get a hotel room. Or park by your vehicle and set up camp there modern. Get, get a modern tent. We don't require people to actually be out there with us camping. We do like you to sit around a campfire because you'll hear a lot of good stories. I knew nothing about CSS Alabama or Shin and Doe until I sat around a campfire one night. Of course, I was 13 years old. Artillery out of the way. The next branch, <coughs> infantry. Uniform, very simple, basic. And being a Yankee is probably the cheapest route for reenacting because this sack coat not only covers uh, infantry, cavalry, artillery, hospital corps, same coat. You know, there, there is one, one thing that a lot of reenactors don't even know. He has on sky blue paints, dark blue blouse. That was a sign at that time of volunteer, U.S. volunteer infantry or cavalry. And I also have a set of cav pants that match this color and whenever, like um, last year at the spring uh, thing up at the CMP, I did have to make sure, do I need to wear sky blues or do I need to wear the federal dark blue as part of the unit to make sure regular army or volunteer army? Federal dark blue pants indicated that you were a regular in the U.S. Army. That was how they knew who was who on the field. Whereas we have over 200 variations of our regimental colors, that right there is how they knew just by looking at who was who. Now you go look at my uniform, gray, butternut, well, that's black trim, jeans, cloth, jeans, wool. Most of them didn't even have jackets at all. To be fair, you have a lot of variations. Yankee, and speaking don't. of variations, this is a variation of a shell jacket. This is a Montgomery Depot. This would have come out of Montgomery, Alabama. The major difference on this jacket and most others is the location of that pocket. There's one surviving example of a Montgomery Depot jacket. It is actually a prisoner of war uniform which is constructed the same way except for I had the black trim put on this as part of our militia and late war impression. And they have Alabama buttons. If anybody wants to see the Alabama scroll button, this jacket has them except for right here where I have it in. So, if anybody wants to see this, by all means. 1860, Governor of the state of Alabama put out an order to, and we actually have a copy of it, he sent it out to Demopolis, Tallahassee Falls, uh, a lot of other places for the specifications for all Alabama troops uniform. Gray jackets, black trim, black collar, black shoulder board that is not usable. That was supposed to be every Alabama troops color, gray and black. Of course, a lot of those states decided to make that their color too. Nobody ever really had it unless you were an officer. You could get your uniform tailor made. Infantry. He's reenactor standard. Now you got mainstream, you got hardcore. Hardcore, they'll sit here and have on the backpack, the roll, everything they need for a whole weekend on top of it. And all that does get heavy and annoying over time. Have a haversack, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I do have an interesting story with this particular haversack. Uh, this was a couch. My dog ate my couch. <laughs> This is all I have left of my old couch. <laughs> and the dog's paw is in the bottom of it. No, no, no. I prefer the dog. But in all honesty, tapestry, this is absolutely period correct. 
If anybody says any difference, we'll, we'll come to blows. But this is absolutely period correct. Now, the material itself may not be, but unless you come up here with a magnifying glass, you cannot tell the difference. So, like I said, this was a couch. It looked good. I saved a bit. Jacket, shirt, pants, brogans, boots, cartridge box, big thing you see on the sides will hold you around. Cat pouch. So a whole that's what fire is thing. Now, cool thing about reenactors, my kepi, my forge cap here. I actually made this with the help of the lady, nice lady that made my jacket. The leather, me, all the other. The cool thing about the black wool. This black wool is actually kind of hard to come by. We had to go all the way to Eastbrook Flea Market. We bought for $10 a full-length black wool ladies coat. This wool, this particular brand of wool right here was the belt. Fits perfectly. The wool on my jacket over there, various pieces of the, uh, the um, jacket. The black wool on my vest is out of that coat. This stuff can be found almost anywhere. Why do I have a black vest? The question is, why would I have a black vest? Really simple. It matches this dark navy blue, it matches my civilian, and it matches my Confederate impression. One vest, all my stuff's covered. Keep on. Unless you like me and you want multiple vests. Well, I'm getting there. Um, let's, go, let's go to the most expensive part of this hobby. Weapons. And uh, clothes are pretty damn expensive. I'm portraying a typical cavalry. He's portraying typical infantry. If you're U.S. impression, you're more than likely going to have a spring field. <coughs> if you're an infantryman, knows how much taller his rifle is compared to mine. Kind of hard to shoot that one off a horse. Thank you. They're both infields. I can't shoot that off a horse. <laughs> now, these are both infields. Infield is very popular, made in England. Of course, we use spring fields, we cut them down. We had various companies in the south that would make weapons, such as Cooking Brothers. New Orleans, then moved to Athens. New Cooking Brothers, uh, only rifle that had a Confederate battle, uh, national flag on the lock plate. Out of Georgia, making armor, you had the J.P. Murray artillery carbine. This carbine, two-band, fire 58 caliber mini ball. Now, a lot of the earlier style Springfields were 69 caliber. Best guess, what's your effective range of that uh, of the weapon? This right here is 800 yards. 12. 1200. 1200. It can't get 1200. Now, on the other hand, me being a coward, I'm gonna have a few more weapons than he does. There's less of us. In order to be an infantryman, you had to have two requirements. A trigger finger, a top and bottom tooth that, mat that, that was opposite each other so you could rip cartridge. That's all you had to have. That's all you had to have. They didn't care if you had a limp, as long as you could get the next mountain. Now, to be a cowardman, you had to have a lot more self-awareness. I have two pistols on. I have a saber. Of course, I'd be sitting on a horse. I don't want that horse shot because now I'm going to have to start walking. But you had various style weapons such as the Philadelphia Derringer. No, 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 this is a screw barrel. That's a screw barrel. You got Philadelphia? Yeah. Does everybody know what a Philadelphia is? Wait a minute. So there's historical significance with a Philadelphia Derringer. Who can tell me? Who knows what the What killed Lincoln? I was going to guess that. The most famous weapon this ever, ever used. This is the style used. weapon killed, that killed Lincoln. That's what killed Abraham Lincoln. From a distance of that far. And it didn't kill him right away. It was several days of doctors pointing, putting their fingers in his brain that actually killed him. Various style pistols. Griswold and Remington. Griswold? Nope, Remington. Well, same thing. Yeah, Colt style. Remington style. 
Griswold was based off the coast. Yes. That's now, the Now, the difference being, in order for me to change this cylinder out, I got to take this pin out, pull the barrel off, pull the cylinder off, put another bar cylinder on there, put the barrel back on there, put that pin on there. Don't do it without an yet. The Remington, which we wanted, all you had to do was sit there half cock it. Rotate the cylinder, pull this down, slide that out, falls out. I can have this cylinder changed out in about 20 seconds. So by the time that guy with that Colt is sitting there reloading, come on so I can shoot you and get your weapons. <laughs> That's why these were very popular. Now, we did use a lot of weapons from earlier time periods. It's an 1847 Colt Walker. Walker Colt, cap and ball Colt. Now, the difference between this one and this one, they're both 44 caliber. This Size one matters. This one was designed, this one was designed to shoot about 25 to 30 grains of powder. Effective range, 25 yards. This one, on the other hand, held the same ball, 90 grains of powder, and would kill you from 200 yards away. This one was made, this was made in 1847, right in time for the Mexican War. Problem with the first model is, is it had a spring right here, which held the loading lever. <coughs> they would break in battle, so the government got rid of them, sold them. Guess who got them? Cowboys, Southerners, we loved it. To give you an idea of 90 grains of powder, this is 55. <coughs> this is what we shoot out of our rifles at a reenactment. 55 grains of powder. This is a cartridge. I made these. Now, the other weapon that a cowboy has, you notice I'm pulling out more stuff as a cowboy. A little more expensive. I do cowboy too. This is called a wrist breaker. This was an 1847 model. Also used in the Mexican War, very popular with the Confederate Army. Now in 1861, they came out with the US 1861 model. A little lighter. It was built a little bit different, but this was very popular in the Confederate service. Why they call it a wrist breaker? Swing it. Uh, no. <laughs> It was twice as heavy as the Model 1861. This actually, believe it or not, was what Nathan Bedford Forrest used. The wrist breaker was what Mosby used. The wrist breaker was what Quan's Trail used. And what Wheeler tried to get for his guys. Now, here's the difference. By 1861, we didn't use a whole lot of them, unless you ran out of your pistols. The Yankees didn't figure that out until 1864. They kept wondering why 500 of our cowmen would decimate 2,000 of theirs in a matter of minutes. Because when, when you go ride into battle with pistols, range in your teeth, that's 12 to 1. Mm -hmm. They got to get that far from you. But yet somebody sitting in the parking lot back there is going to already have me taken out. The cavalry raids that Forrest and all the rest of them had. There was a reason they were called the best dressed Confederate soldiers the U.S. Army could provide for. <laughs> they steal everything from wagon trains, they, they would mow them down. Cavalry, we do dismounted. Well, what, what I call unmounted. A lot of people don't like unmounted cavalry. But if that's your mode of transportation with all this weight, are you going to sit there and intentionally ride him somewhere, hop off, shoot your rifle for 30 minutes and risk your horse getting killed? Unless you were horse to horse, you got off of him and you saved him. So that's three main types of reenactors. But what else could you do? We got Mr. Jefferson Davis sitting back there. That's a reenactor. Anybody ever read The Fire Eater, William Lowndes Yancey? 
if you were to sit here and get the spirit of his speeches and go get your little outfit and talk about the secession of the state of Alabama against that tyrannical government sitting here trying to raise our taxes and take our homeland from us, our culture. We need that. We need that. Because if you don't come out and help us show these millennials, if you don't know your history, you're what? Do and repeat it. <coughs> talking earlier about the new people getting the young ones. Our unit is just like a Confederate unit of the time period. We got old guys, we got young ones. Yes, you're old. I'm old. <laughs> I'm not the oldest. There's two others. The average, the average age of our unit is 28 years old. But how many 20 year olds we got in our unit? Two. Uh, wait a minute. You got uh, 15, 14, just turned 18, and at least two under 20 in one family. 15, 14, 14, 14, 16, 17, 18. That's, that's a good chunk of our group. One of our reenactors, Faith, she'll pull that hair down, round her face, turns into Frank. Meanest some bitch you've ever met. <laughs> yep, and she was just elected our corporal at the age of 14. Wow. Okay, more about reenacting. School days, school days are a lot of fun. Uh, we get questions from, is that fire real? Are you going to eat that meat cooking over it? Are those guns real? <coughs> is know, that squirrel on the spit real? I said, it's real and it's very tasty. Um, one of the things I, I really dig, this is a mini ball. This is a large version of a mini ball. Because seeing my thumb versus seeing this, two different monsters. This the kids can see, I don't have to pass it around, or I can pass it around. But if I pass that mini ball around, it may not come back to me. Uh, one of the nifty things we do, hiding in plain sight. Example, my 69 caliber cartridge box. This box is designed to hold a thousand rounds of 69 caliber. What do I do with this box? It is my cleaning kit for my rifles. I have another one just like it. All my tent stakes and tent ropes go in. At camp, close that up, put another box on top of it. Somebody's got a place to pop the tiny. Uh, one of the things we do is also in this box, I've got over 700 rounds. That's almost five pounds of black powder. Did you shoot? Already rolled, yeah, ready to go. Mm -hmm. These are what I take on my field, open up and discard. Why they're rolled up like this is because when they travel, they don't mix up, they don't become open, and they don't lose their powder. See, no shaking. Last year, I took the time and effort to make period correct uh, uh, arsenal packs. Ten rounds. From Tallahassee Arsenal, I kind of make that up. You want to pass that around? Remember, that is black powder. Don't smoke it. Uh, shoes. I'm rather fun. Oh, my shoes. Let me see these. This one. These are Yankee. Um, oh crap! What? Are, uh, uh, the the vendor thing. Um, Contract. These are Yankee contract shoes for infantry. The nice thing about Yankee contract shoes, they had to be shipped. Those shipments were often interrupted and worn by Confederates. Yankee shoe, Confederate shoe, same shoe. The only difference between this and a Jefferson Brogan is about a half inch. Now, you will notice there's metal stobs on that shoe which is really good for walking in the grass, walking in the mud, and not slipping because you have smooth leather bottoms. They are horrible for walking on modern floors that are hard. You will slip and fall. These are 
uh, artillery boots and late war cavalry boots. There's that, the flat is not in the boot, right there. These two have the, uh, the, uh, um, the hobnails and horseshoes. <clears throat> I, I put duct tape on these because I used these at a, a, a living history not too long ago and it was mostly inside and I did not want to slip and fall so I put duct tape on the bottom of these. Reenacting. Uh, okay, there is a nice lady down in Atmore, her name is Susan Amos, Southern Flags and Quilts. I had her make uh, my own she, personal flag. She has made four flags for our unit. This one I had done without stars and I painted the stars on myself. Well, actually I got my wife to do it. Okay. The very first flag I ordered from Susan Amos was for the Dallas and Cotton Bells OCR chapter. And I had it based, believe it or not, off of the first Army of Northern Virginia silk issue battle flag, which had 12 stars and it was pink. The reason it was pink was because they were still trying to use silk. And well, blockade already started. In order to get a close enough color silk, they had to use silk from ladies' wedding dresses. So the very first one she made was for the Towsie Cotton Bells that I ordered. From. <coughs> she made our 8th Confederate Cavalry Regimental flag. She actually first, the very first one she ever hand painted was I gave her the regulations for an 1862 Yankee guide on. Then she made a flag for Maggie Hesley, another pink flag, when she died. Her family has that. Now, um, we going all Who's got the holster? Who's got the it's back here. I made that. That's one of my hobbies is leather work. I made this ammo box. It's another bad hobby I've picked up. One of the nifty things about being reenactors, we have tons of reference material. We have the reference material. We have it coming out our ears. Um, that's not, we don't have to go to camp, suffer through winters, and figure out what works and what doesn't work. We have the reference materials. All that being said, that tells you about reenactors. We need reenactors. What about reenactors? I'll tell you right now. It is a lot of hard work to put on a reenactment. And I would love, I would love to see the Prattville Dragoons get either a reenactment over here, and I've, I've talked to him. Mr. Mr. Jackson Allen over here has some interest because he hates Yankees. Y'all know who I'm talking about. You have Will Dismuke to say. He has land. He has actually expressed interest in having He has expressed interest. As a matter of fact, some of y'all don't know, he has over 300 acres of original battlefield in Corinth. And where his land is was actually where, where an artillery battery was. He wants to do events. Talking to legislators, they want to give money for events. They're tired of giving stuff to the civil rights. If you know the 200 Alabama celebration, we weren't invited for crap. They gave us just enough permission to put their logo on a fence because the Alabama Bicentennial Commission wanted to be politically correct. The representatives are tired of it. State of Alabama won a Commerce Tourism Award. Why? Because of civil rights. But yet we could get three times as many people in here if we could call our legislators and put more events on them. Right. It, ta it takes a year to plan a reenactment. Wow. Arms book. This thing would normally run you 50 bucks at the bookstore. I paid a dollar for it at an event. Go to an event. People sell stuff. I paid a dollar for this. Jeez. If you go to events, we, we will not start up here in Alabama until we have a little living history in Argo, we have a little something in North Alabama. We will not start with events until the very last of October. That is a SCV event, the Battle of Ten Islands at Janie Furness in Ohatchee. 
You can find stuff cheap if you want to get in a hobby or your kids or grandkids or your cousin, sister. We don't care. If you're a female, we'll let you on the field with a rifle. I don't care. But, but I would love to see the Prattwood Dragoons put on the fence because we need more down here. Everything is in North Alabama. Everything is in North Alabama. Yep. The only thing we have here is Tallahassee, since we got screwed. Except for the Gulf Coast. In Selma. Tell them about the Mule Day Parade. Now that being said, we have land right outside of Selma, right outside the city limits that is on original battlefield. The person is wanting to put on an event, but there needs to be a sponsor. Now I'm talking about a year's worth of planning. You got to plan parking. You got to plan your land site. The Tallahassee event, we've put 20 something years worth of land improvements. Now, over time, we let it grow up. Phil Davis went in there and knocked a bunch of it down, but he's making improvements he wants. I'll tell you this, the very first year we went to Tallahassee and started improving Bill Anthony's property, we increased his property value by about $15,000. Clearing land, mowing bushes, cutting trees. Now, if you do an event, you have to make a budget and stick with it. Now, there are ways you can get grants for anything to <coughs> put on an event. I know a reenactment group that got a grant from the federal government to buy four cannons. So that they could sit here and reenact what was Stonewall, can what was Stonewall Jackson's most famous cannons? Matthew, Mark, Lou, and John. And they bought all four of them. Thank you to the subtle government. There's money for this, but you got to advertise. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I know the camera's recording. My biggest hang up in 23 years of tallacy is lack of advertisement. Yep. Because if you don't put the money out there, the spectators ain't coming. No. You got to reenactors. Yep. You got to have somebody knows how to coordinate with these people. There you go. Our unit. We're one year old. But yeah, we've been doing this 50 years combined. Any yeah. questions? We have to, we've been told we need to start wrapping it up. Any questions? By well, why are you telling me i got to wrap it up? Go ahead. Any questions? Go ahead. Just out of curiosity, you said somebody in Selma, outside of Selma, is that coming in or going out? Just on the other side of Selma. Uh, coming in to? Coming in from the northern part. Okay. Which actually followed the line that the Yankees pushed down. All right. Is 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 whoever this is is his name confidential? Uh, I can get you in touch with the proper people. Okay. <clears throat> this person also, as a matter of fact, has about 500 pounds of powder. That's original <laughs> silver that he got out from the tunnel. But I wonder if is, I know. is this where they had the original Battle of Selma? That the was, Battle of Selma stretched over. I mean, different. Technically, 50 miles. Okay. Battle of Selma was the, in the general vicinity of Selma, including inside the city. The place, where they, do the, the place where they do the reenactment at Selma, yeah. which was funded by the state, the federal government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Last year, we rode by there. They have turned it into a garbage dump. Garbage dump? They have taken everything out of it and, turn, and, and has started putting Leaves and limbs and everything they pick up from the sand there. Now I'm gonna shut up, but we've got a lot of stuff up here. If you want to come look at it, please put your hands on it. We don't care. If anybody has a relative that you may think might be interested, I got a business card with my number on it. Y'all can get in touch with Doug. We keep back up. Or Bear. Bear. We get back up first of February. And we will hit it hard and strong until it gets too hot for us. Then we'll move up north. And come fall, we'll be right back down here again. Wait, are y'all part of the Alabama Division? I am not. Right. We are part of the First Division of Reenactors Association, Southern Reenactors Association, which stretches from Virginia to Texas. Larger network. Now, we have tons more we can say, but we're almost out of time, so we'll catch a few more questions. 
How many battles did y'all see? I go every year to the Winfield skirmish. Yeah, Win you come? the skirmish and of I'm really, people. I, I'm really proud of you, man, because I see you getting out there showing stuff with kids. I was and there. Family. You I know what battle of pumpkin he, spice. He just he he like to be kid. The, 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 he and I are like you're, you're the, the adult. Service Lux Lapidio, which is actually a part of Winfield Mule Days. Yeah, Mule Day Parade. They That's had right. forty thousand people that that uh, send on Mule Day. Yeah, <laughs> you, you really ought to go, people. And where's the other ones up that way? You go. We to? have one in Ohatchee at Jamie oh, Furnace. That's a SCV event. It's right between. It's just between Talladega and Gadsden. Fiddler's Green. A lot of y'all may know uh, Unreconstructed the band. That's yeah, their house. They're they're in SC. They're in Pelham Camp. Well, it used to be the Pelham Camp. Uh, the yeah. Battle of Decatur Labor Day weekend. That's an SCV event. Gainesville. The weekend after the weekend after Easter. The SCV helps us put that on. But that's the Magoo <laughs> family. We have so many SCV events. But one of the problems, and I'm, I'm sorry if I step on a toe, one of the problems that I saw years ago in the SCV, nobody from North Alabama will help anybody in South Alabama do anything. And if we don't start supporting each yeah. other yeah. as camps, <laughs> not as brigade, yeah. but as camps, what are we out here for? No. Sorry, uh, my rant. If anybody else has any questions for these guys, come on up and, and uh, check out uh, all of the uh, merchandise. <coughs> oh, but, this uh, quilt. Did I say anything about the quilt yet? No. We don't want Yard to. sale. It's free. <laughs> Where? There you go. Yard sale. It's very authentic. It was free from a yard sale. There you go. Oh, uh, <laughs> please, uh, you know, if you uh, want to tip your server and all, and... Uh, Maybe uh, clean up a little bit after yourselves, but uh, again, I think we had, had a great uh, meeting here. I appreciate uh, Harold and Carl uh, finding this place for us, and uh, please extend our appreciation to the folks here.